Hello everyone, I'm Bethlehem Atfield. Welcome to the podcast Journey to Ethiopia with Story. In this program, I'll be reading an excerpt from my unpublished novel, Pride on a Pedestal. 1988, Nazareth, Ethiopia. My maternal grandmother was a force to be reckoned with. Historically, Harari are the elite tribe in Harar. My grandmother, however, born of a prominent Argoba Muslim mother and a rich Gotu farmer father, still had a good standing in Harari society. Although the Oromo were considered inferior to the Harari tribe in the city, she was known as a wise woman in the community. Widowed relatively young, she was a matriarch in her own right in a small town located near the city of Harar in eastern Ethiopia. She often told the story of how her own mother tortured the Egyptians who burned her village. Whenever my grandmother told this story, her strong, deep voice assumes melodic tilt as if she wanted to sing praises to her mother. Although the Egyptians occupied Harar for a short time, their rule was harsh and cruel. The Emirate of Harar has been an independent territory for over 200 years. Like all Emirates, we were supposedly under the protection of the Ottoman Turks until the Khedivs occupied it. Then they started treating our people as if they were slaves. They annulled our ownership of properties. They often found excuses to flog our people with a carbash, a heavy hide whip, or even cut their hands. Fortunately, the English defeated the Khedivet and ordered the Egyptian garrisons in Harbor to withdraw. Before departure, these cruel masters wanted to give us a memorable farewell. They burned some local villages, including a village that my parents used to have a large tenure in. Our people were furious. They organized themselves and went to have vengeance. While the men were away looking for their perpetrators, my mother assembled the women and ordered them to build a grass hut. Finally, when the men brought the culprits with their hands and legs tied, she requested for them to be placed inside the freshly made grass hut and torched it. It is a shame that my mother did not take after her strong maternal lineage. Instead, I think she grew up being intimidated by powerful women in her family that she ended up being timid. Poor Emma. My mother's name is Fatima. When I was a baby, I tried to call her name, but managed only the last sound, which stuck even as I grew up. My brother followed my lead and also took to calling her Emma. I smelled the scrambled eggs first, then heard my mother calling me for breakfast. I heard her ask my brother, Have you washed your hands, Noor? Yes, Emma. Let me see, said Emma, knowing full well that Noor hasn't. He reluctantly opened his curled fingers to show his dirty palms. Do you know how germs could live in there? My mother tirelessly repeats her litany about hygiene. She is a science teacher by profession. Noor turned to me, gave me a quick wink and went out to wash his hands. I smiled and said, good morning, Ima, and gave her a hug. She smiled back and gave me a kiss on my forehead. She didn't bother to check my hands. She knows I'm obsessed about washing hands. The new boy came through the door shaking his wet hands and awkwardly stood by the table. The way his face is slack with his mouth slightly agape at all times made him look like an idiot. Sit, my mother said, gesturing to the chair next to Norris. There was no anger on her voice. She served him a portion of eggs and a fresh bun. I wondered how she could be so kind and forgiving. As for me, just seeing him happily tucking away the food my mother cooked made me lose my appetite. The next day, I went to Agitu's house looking for my mother. A mama had also come to visit. A mama adopted my father like her own son 
when he first arrived from Karen and rented the house next door to hers in Awasa. My mother, who is usually quiet and self-controlled around us, was quite vocal with Mama. Your son doesn't know the meaning of family owner. He has no respect for me as his wife, nor does he care about his children. This is not the man I married, Mama. Her voice broke down as she said this. Mama smacked her lips loud and nodded her head. I remember the gallant young man who walked through my door 20 years ago, she agreed. He had all the right ideals under his belt then. She chuckled at the memory. <laughs> but the fact is your husband is a health officer by profession. His work requires him to go away from home on field visits often. Being a handsome and charming man, women seem to fling themselves at him. Sadly, he doesn't have the discipline to resist these situations. I noticed Agitu was unusually quiet during this conversation. I guess this was a shocking news for her too. As I quietly backed out, I think I got what Mama was saying. The man these women adore is mere human after all. I tried to remember my earliest memories of my father. It's true, Papa was a loving and gentle father. He was openly affectionate to Emma, my brother and myself. During his long absences while on field trips, we all yearned for his safe return. We celebrated his homecoming for days on end. The next couple of times I packed my mother's bag encouraging her to leave were also caused by similar discoveries of my father's infidelities and irresponsibility. By the time I turned 10, my grievances against my father were no longer on behalf of my mother but myself. That was the year I found out for the first time that I had an older brother, Alula. My mother told me that Baba had told her about Alma's and their son Alola before she married him. Apparently, both my parents didn't see any sense in either telling me and my brother or introducing us to our half-brother. By the time I was 12, my father's eccentricity and hypocrisy was starting to drive me mad. He had become a total control freak and wanted me to be at home at all times except for school hours. Run away from home. The year I turned 15 years old was particularly a hard one. The boys in my school were suddenly like vultures. They all hung around me and seemed to want a part of me. It didn't take long for my parents to notice this because men outside of the school also had that devouring look in their eyes, even when I was with my parents. One Friday evening, my father scolded me and created the usual havoc about my coming back late after school. I sat down on my bed cross-legged and sulked. I wasn't even with my boyfriend, Jonas. I had only gone to Ida's house to watch a video. I felt a finality settle in my heart. Then, suddenly, I calmed right down. That was it. Tomorrow would be the day I leave, I whispered to myself. When Ima went out shopping the next morning, I rummaged through her drawers and took 50 burr. I hurriedly wrote a note to tell my parents not to look for me. Just so you know, I'm not running away with a man, I added as an afterthought, and left the note on their bed. I grabbed the bag I packed the night before and left home. Instead of going to the bus stop as planned though, I found myself walking to the cafe next to Jonas's house. There were a couple of adults having coffee on the terrace, but there was no sign of Jonas. I gestured to the shoeshine boy sitting by the stairs. He left his box and came trotting to me. I slipped 50 cents into his hands and said, Do you know Jonas, the boy who lives in that house? He bobbed his head in acknowledgement and wiped his nose on his sleeves. Go and tell him his friend is waiting for him. He bobbed his head again and trotted off. Five minutes later, the gate to Jonas's house was swung open and I was relieved to see Jonas step out. 
He was wearing a t-shirt and a pair of jogging pants. None of his usual swagger this morning. He dragged his flip-flops with effort. His hair was matted. His eyes were still swollen with sleep. The pimples on his forehead look exceptionally inflamed. I was sure if he opened his mouth to greet me, I would smell his stale breath. All I wanted was to live this boring life. Why am I even here? I was upset with myself. As he got closer to where I was, I quickly turned around and left without a word. Layla, he called out with a surprise. His grogginess seemed to have evaporated. With a couple of long strides, he reached out and grabbed my arm. I shrieked his hold of me. He has noticed the weekend bag I was carrying and seemed concerned. Where are you going? I'm going to add this. I just came to say goodbye, I replied. But you seem to have changed your mind. You were just about to leave without a word. Do I look that awful? He asked as he ran his hand over his hair. Kind of, I mumbled. Look, why don't you go and order a cafe latte or something and give me ten minutes to freshen up? Then you can properly say goodbye to me, he said with a weak smile and grabbed my hand again. This time, I didn't shrug it off. I followed him to the cafe. I was halfway through my latte when he came back. Wow, you scraped up fast, I said teasingly. Sorry, I shouldn't have come out like that in the first place, he apologized, as he pulled a chair and sat next to me. The next time I looked at my watch, three hours had passed. Having emptied my grievances to Jonas, my anger, along with my resolve to leave, seemed to have gone down. Jonas also seemed to have noticed this and urged me to stay. But the idea of going back still felt dreadful, so I dragged myself out. Jonas saw me off to the bus stop. At the station, he kissed me goodbye and slipped his hand in my left jeans pocket. The bus to Addis had only five people inside. The driver opened the front seat door for me and told me it would fill in a couple of minutes. I promised Jonas I would call him as soon as I get to my uncle's house and got in the bus. A couple of minutes stretched into an hour and by the time the bus was full and we started our journey, it was already 4 p.m. Sorry you had to wait long, the driver apologized as he pulled the bus out of the station. He shrugged and continued. The bus before this one was filled in 10 minutes. Transport business is unpredictable. It's okay, I'm not in a hurry, I said, and I looked out at the road as the crowd of people, horse-drawn carts and packed animals started to thin out as we got to the main motor road to Addis. I felt the driver giving me that long searching look again. I couldn't be bothered to turn to him. I continued staring out at the scenes on the road. Past cars packed with families sped towards Nazareth perhaps eager to get to Sodori Hot Spring Resorts and chill there. Most of the cars heading to Addis were buses, trucks or four-wheel aid worker vehicles. I sadly nodded in satisfaction. I have arrived at that place, a state of mind where nothing seems to matter. No worries, no anger, no anticipation, no planning. I have taken a bold step to leave home. I had no idea how life would turn out in Addis. I was happy for fate to take over. So, what awaits you in Addis? The driver asked as if he was following my muse. I took a good look at him and decided to be honest with him. I don't know. He chuckled by the unexpected reply and sucked his breath. Well, it's a big city for a small girl who doesn't know her way, don't you think? No sneering intended. I looked at him again. He was young himself, maybe in his early 20s. I noted earlier that he was short. To make up for his height, he was wearing a trendy Timberland combat boots with chunky heels. My friends and I were into brands, as most urban youth were, but we were not bothered with authenticity. We were happy with an item if it looked like an original design and bear the brand. 
The boots the driver was wearing could be a Timberland replica made in China or even here in Ethiopia, but everybody called it Timberland. I also noticed that the driver was good-looking and neat. He was steady in his driving, no silly maneuvers so far. I'm Muslim, by the way, he offered his right hand out. I'm Leila, I shook his hand and smiled at his formality. His cleanly shaven face looked earnest. He had kind but intense eyes. Mesvin went on to describe the quirks of the capital city. He had a humorous way of describing the hardships of living in an overcrowded city. Addis is like a huge magnet. People migrate to the capital from all over the country. The rich come to indulge in the comforts the city offers. The poor come in the hope to earn a living. He talked about how rich some of the beggars were. They stash almost all the cash given to them as alms by religious people. They stuff it under their mattress until death. Money for them is an end, not a means to comfort. As we get near Lagar in Addis, traffic got heavier. Masven stopped talking and concentrated more on dodging pedestrians and honking cars. People were rushing around like ants. Others were patiently queuing for taxi or bus. Masven pulled at the bus stop and cut the engine. As people in the bus prepared to leave, I nervously shuffled in my seat and made a vague motion of preparing to leave as well. My body was stiff from anxiety, and my face must have also shown concern. Lila, you don't have to leave now. Stay with me while I do one more shuttle back to Nazareth, and then you can stay with me until you figure out what you want to do. I let out a long breath, and I nodded my agreement. That evening, I found myself back in the same town I was so eager to leave. Masfin claimed that he was tired and it was not safe to drive back to Addis in the dark. Instead of going home, I found myself in a small hotel with a man I had only made that afternoon. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to listen to more stories as soon as they are released, please subscribe to this channel. Until the next story, goodbye.